<sighs> so, in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. Way back in February of 2021, when the Vulcan Centaur Pathfinder was delivered to Cape Canaveral, I was so confident that this rocket was going to be conducting its first static fires by the end of the year. The end of 2021, that is. However, it became very clear, as a matter of fact, it really had been clear for a very long time, that ULA and the impressive Vulcan Centaur project had one massive Achilles heel. <laughs> And no, it's not the solid rocket boosters from Northrop Grumman. These things seem to be performing perfectly, at least the latest versions of them, just as all of their previous solid rocket boosters have performed. These are going to be providing the vast majority of the thrust for the Vulcan Centaur. I think we all know where the problem really lies. And yeah, all of you guessed it, probably because of the title of this video, the problem lies with the BE-4 once again. This engine has continued to be a massive thorn in the side of ULA, in the side of Vulcan, and this has caused a tremendous amount of consternation on the part of the ULA engineering team that depends so much on the Vulcan Centaur coming to a successful conclusion. So what's going on right now? And what has happened with the history of BE-4 that has led to this problem with Vulcan Centaur? And what does this mean for the future of ULA? Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... First of all, I need to ask my viewers for one big favor. Those of you who have been waiting for the next episode of Alien Week, I promise that it will be coming tomorrow. For those of you who haven't been watching it, I urge you to actually consider the videos that I've been releasing lately, which although not in my general genre of slamming on Jeff Bezos or slamming on Boeing, are incredibly interesting. And not only that, demonstrate why I'm really an angry astronaut. I'm angry because the current scientific climate does not encourage astronomers and other scientists to even consider the possibility that anomalies like what you're looking at right now, that is to say a ring system that's over a hundred million kilometers in diameter, might be of alien origin. Linked in the description, I have videos about potential alien megastructures that the media almost never talks about, a new mission to track down a Muamua, which I think is very exciting, and other topics which I really believe would be a refreshing change of pace for all of you. And not only that, the YouTube algorithm is saying that because I don't get a lot of viewers on this, it just doesn't get recommended when I release these kinds of videos, which I think isn't fair to my viewers. You guys deserve some variety. Okay, let's move on. On August 11th, 2022, it was announced that SpaceX had won certification from the Pentagon Space Force to use recyclable boosters on its Falcon Heavy rocket to launch spy satellites. This gives Elon Musk and SpaceX a pricing edge over many of their competitors, especially, of course, the Vulcan Centaur and ULA, who are theoretically contracted to carry 60% of the upcoming missions for the next five years under the current contract. However, it's obvious that the military have started to look at Falcon Heavy as possibly their only backup solution for Vulcan Centaur, especially for some of their geosynchronous orbits. Falcon 9 is simply not capable of carrying some of the military's heavier satellites up to that lofty orbit. 
Falcon Heavy obviously can. Now Vulcan Centaur also can, plus it has a much larger fairing, giving it a lot more theoretical flexibility over the Falcon Heavy. Even though the Falcon Heavy can carry more payload, the military doesn't have any contracts or any satellites that really require that massive amount of payload. Fairing volume is the key issue, and the Vulcan Centaur has a slightly larger fairing as far as diameter is concerned, and considerably longer when we're talking about length, over 17 meters as opposed to just over 13 meters for the Falcon 9. And in spite of the military's request for SpaceX to create an extended fairing in order to accommodate some of these bigger payloads, SpaceX has yet to accomplish it, which means that the military awarded Vulcan Centaur the most promising new launch vehicle to emerge in the near future, some sort of award in regards to that. And before you start laughing, there's lots of reasons that they did this. Vulcan Centaur isn't really going to be considerably more expensive than Falcon Heavy, and it will be more flexible in terms of the types of payload it can carry, and also the Centaur 5 upper stage is going to be capable of multiple secondary missions, reducing the cost even further, plus smart reuse on the BE-4 engines, which will bring the price down even further. That's why I've been so supportive of this rocket for so long, but unfortunately, it continues to have a massive problem, as we all know, and the BE-4's list of failures is almost impossible to comprehend. Now forgive me because I'm about to get really worked up right now. Blue Origin began work on the BE-4 in 2011. 2005. 11. At the time, Blue Origin seemed to have a pretty good plan because they recognized that once Aerojet acquired Rocketdyne in 2012, there was going to be a substantial amount of chaos at that company while they integrated their systems. It always happens during the process of any merger, and so Blue Origin saw the opportunity of introducing a new engine that could be utilized by the military while Aerojet at Rocketdyne was developing a new heavy engine of their own, and that is actually still the case. Aerojet Rocketdyne is not scheduled to have their new engine ready for at least another year. In spite of BE-4's many, many failures, they're still ahead of the game, disgusting as that may sound. But here's the deal. Blue Origin actually had the nerve to announce that this engine would be flight ready by 2017. All they managed to do in October of 2017, by the way, was to test fire the engine at 50% thrust for three seconds three seconds, and then in 2018, they pushed it up to 65% for 114 seconds. Obviously, this engine was not going to be available for several years, and then they announced that it would be maybe 2020. Well, obviously, that didn't happen, although the first Pathfinder BE-4 engines were indeed delivered in July of 2020, so maybe that's what they meant. However, by that same year, it became very obvious that the BE-4 problem was having significant issues. It includes, amongst other things, turbo pump problems, combustion instability, overheating, shorter than planned engine life, and also incomprehensibly insufficient hardware to build development engines. They're backed by the richest guy on the planet, and yet they didn't have sufficient hardware to proceed with engine development the way every other company does and as a result, they had to deliver flight engines not even fully assembled in tandem with still developing the damn things to ULA, which means that formal delivery wouldn't actually happen until 2020.
2022, which by the way, it already has. And at that point, all ULA and Blue Origin, but especially ULA could do was pray. And apparently they didn't pray to the right rocket gods. Now, let me emphasize everything I'm about to say right now is simply a rumor coming from sources that do not work directly for ULA, but who have not been wrong up to this point. So they're very, very reliable, even though they're not officially insiders. That having been said, though, the two flight certified engines, or at least theoretically flight certified engines, were delivered to ULA a couple of months ago, as we all know, and all these things had to do is to get put on the test stand for some brief test fires and then shipped to the Cape and installed on the Vulcan Centaur's first stage. Or at least, that's the theory. What actually happened is one of the engines started leaking fuel on the test stand. Engines that had been tested time and again in front of Tori Bruno for thousands of seconds without a single hiccup, and yet all they had to do was build two more of these damn engines and build them well, but instead they ended up with at least one engine that was leaking fuel. Now, this may be a minor issue. This may be something that can be corrected rapidly. ULA is still shooting, to be clear, still shooting for the end of the year. However, that launch date is starting to look less and less likely. In the meantime, relationships between ULA and Blue Origin have started to fall apart. Blue Origin actually had the gall to ask ULA for more money back in 2021. Utterly absurd and disgustingly arrogant, really. I mean, they're delivering their product half a decade late and they want more money? What, because it was more difficult to develop? I don't think that's your customer's problem. And by the way, ULA has been making excellent progress with every other aspect of this rocket. And fortunately, the engines on the upper stage are built by Aerojet Rocketdyne. That having been said, however, there is absolutely nothing that ULA can do to push this process along anymore. They just need to pray that this problem is minor and the problem only pushes them out perhaps until the first quarter of 2023 at the latest and that's for a very important reason. By 2023 by law U.S. rockets can no longer carry U.S. military payloads to orbit if they're utilizing Russian engines and of course the Atlas V, the old reliable of ULA utilizes Russian engines which means it will be banned from carrying any military cars goes. ULA desperately needs the Vulcan Centaur to be operational and there's only one thing standing in their way. So while Blue Origin celebrates the latest launch of their new Shepard, which is probably the most inconsequential thing that they could be doing right now, what they absolutely need to be doing is addressing this issue as aggressively as possible. And by the way, if these rockets are already starting to leak fuel on the test stand before they've even been installed on the rocket, that doesn't bode well for the future of these engines, especially when it comes to reusability. Yes, the Vulcan Centaur will not be reusing these engines at first, but smart reusability is a critical part of this rocket's future, especially if it's going to be competing against the likes of Falcon Heavy and Starship. And speaking of Starship, Blue Origin's troubles with BE-4 actually, believe it or not, doesn't bode well for Starship at all. Even though we like to believe that SpaceX is absolutely perfect and Blue Origin is absolutely incompetent, it's not necessarily as simple as all that. Raptor utilizes a lot of the same technology. As a matter of fact, this technology more aggressively uses 
turbo pumps, and stage combustion in order to generate the maximum amount of thrust. And the Raptor 1s, at least, experience fuel leaks on more than one occasion, leading to the destruction of at least one of their prototypes. If Blue Origin is struggling so mightily against problems with two engines, how likely is SpaceX to be successful with their first 33 engines? I think it's far more likely that they're going to lose the first couple of boosters at least as a result of a few failed engines. Now, who knows? SpaceX may just be such masters of rocket technology that their first orbital launch goes off without a hitch and they gain a practical monopoly on the launch to low Earth orbit market plus a lot of other business opportunities. Right now, the level of confidence with Starship is not quite there. Their first serious commercial contract is not due to fly until 2024, indicating that there are many companies who seriously doubt that this rocket is actually going to be ready by 2023. That having been said, though, I desperately hope that the first orbital launch attempt is a complete success. And one of the main reasons that I'm hoping that is not because I'm going to get a SpaceX fanboy tattoo on my butt as a result of losing this bet, but rather that I'm going to have a front row seat at Rocket Ranch Starbase. The owner of this property has generously offered me this incredible opportunity of watching the first orbital launch from just over five kilometers away as opposed to eight or nine kilometers from South Padre Island. It is both exciting and utterly terrifying, but thank you so much for that opportunity. So smash that like, hit that subscribe, also please hit that notification button. It's important to my content, and also check the description for various ways to keep this content coming, and as always, stay angry about space!